The Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute is pleased to present this webinar, Expanding CLSI Access with Health System Membership. My name is Darian, and I'm your host for today's program. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and all participants are muted. Closed captioning is accessible through the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. The program will last up to 45 minutes and will include question and answer opportunities. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time throughout using the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. In a few moments, we will be sending you a link to the handouts through the chat box at the bottom of your screen. This includes a copy of the PowerPoint slides, which will be available in both a full page and three slides per page view. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Diana Kremitsky is the Vice President of Institute Operations Laboratory Medicine for Guy Singer. Diana has 37 years experience in the laboratory profession with most of those spent in hospitals of an integrated health system. Currently, Ms. Kremitsky holds an executive leadership role as Vice President in the Diagnostic Medicine Institute at Guy Singer, overseeing laboratory operations and system courier services at eight hospital campuses and numerous numerous clinics. She also participates in overseeing Guy Singer's patient blood management program. She received her bachelor's degree in medical technology and a master's degree in chemistry and a master's degree in healthcare administration, all from the University of Scranton, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Barbara Booth is the Laboratory Quality Systems Senior Coordinator at Geisinger, Wyoming Valley Medical Center, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. She provides leadership in regulatory and quality management activities for the Geisinger Laboratory Medicine. Barbara holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Medical Technology from Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania, is certified in Just Culture, and is a volunteer inspector for the College of American Pathologists. Gina Hausman is the Director of Quality, Patient Safety, and Accreditation for Laboratories at Health Partners, a large integrated health system based in Minnesota. In this role, she provides leadership and oversight for laboratory safety, quality improvement, education, data analytics, document control, regulatory, and accreditation. Gina has 18 years of healthcare experience, including roles in clinical microbiology, infection prevention, and hospital regulatory compliance. She has previously spoken at regional and national conferences on the topics of microbiology testing, diagnostic stewardship, and high reliability in the lab. Her current areas of interest are regulatory compliance, high reliability, and test utilization. Jessica Treadway is CLSI's Customer Relationship Manager. Her responsibilities include building, retaining, maintaining, and fostering relationships between CLSI and its stakeholders, including members, customers, volunteers, and vendors. At this time, I'll turn it over to Jessica to get us started. Thank you all for joining us today. We are excited to have guest member speakers from Geisinger and Health Partners who will begin with member testimonials. I will then go over the health system membership benefits in more details and share additional resources for delegates along with some CLSI updates. I will now hand it off to Diana. Thank you, Jessica. It's really our pleasure to be here today, Barbara and I, to talk about Geisinger Laboratory and our experiences with the CLSI a health system membership. To begin, we'd like to just tell you a little bit about our laboratory. This is a picture of our core laboratory that's based in Danville, Pennsylvania, and it's on the campus of Geisinger Medical Center. We operate a consolidated laboratory operation where the majority of our outpatient testing is performed in our core laboratory. Approximately 70% of our testing is performed in our core laboratory in Danville. In addition, our health system, our laboratory system, has eight hospital-based laboratories, as well as one laboratory in a healthplex, and a few rapid response laboratories that are throughout our health system that are usually located in a multi-specialty practice that has an infusion clinic or a surgical practice. We're really fortunate to have a highly integrated laboratory system, as well as a state-of-the-art core laboratory. 
we will end up this current fiscal year with roughly performing about 15 million billable procedures laboratory wide. This depicts uh, how we cover Geisinger service area. The dark blue area is the primary service area of our health system. The lighter blue area is the secondary service area of our health system. And you could see the hospital locations that are within that graphic. In addition, uh, the entire state of Pennsylvania is a service area of our health plan. And at times our laboratory services extend throughout the state as we support our health plan in closing care gaps. This depicts how our laboratories actually interface with our core laboratory. There's a lot of activity going on at any one day throughout all of our laboratories. We are actually highly standardized. We are all on the same testing platforms. We are all integrated on the same LIS for both anatomic pathology as well as clinical pathology. And we have been on the same LIS for decades with our recent conversion to Epic Beaker. The rectangles depict our numerous Geisinger clinics, which we serve with laboratory services, as well as we oversee all of the courier services for the system. So our couriers do travel throughout the system to all of these locations. Uh, they actually have about 42 couriers on the road on any one day. And it's really amazing throughout the year, they rack up about 1.8 million miles. So an extensive courier ne network serving our system as well as those secondary markets that were shown on the previous slide. Our laboratory is unique, I think, in that we have a really nice scientific and medical structure that provides dedicated resources 24-7, 365 to all of our entities. So there is an abbreviated list of entities at the top of this slide. And uh, we go by a lot of acronyms within our health system, as, I sure, as I'm sure many of you do as well. But they represent all of our hospital-based laboratories, as well as our clinic-based laboratories. And those staff have access to dedicated resources system-wide, whether it be a chemistry director, transfusion medicine director, hematology and coagulation directors, microbiology directors, and such. We also have quality system coordinators, and my colleague Barbara Booth is one of those. And those quality coordinators sit at our larger locations and support the system. In addition, all of our entities do enjoy the capabilities of our centralized laboratory contact services, or we call them client services. And this is the location where they handle all of our critical value notifications, customer inquiries, dispatching to couriers, scheduling of home phlebotomies, et cetera. So really a robust set of services. I'd like to transition now to tell you a little bit about why we feel um, our membership with CLSI is so valued. Uh, one of our primary benefits is really the great and vast access to all of the CLSI documents by all of our staff through Eclipse. We also find that the educational products, we tend to now participate in as a group. And one of the recent examples is the e-learning course for the LQMS certification. And Barbara will talk about that a little bit later on. As far as what the staff see that are most valued, it's that easy access to published standards by all of our medical directors, PhD scientific leaders, as well as our technical leaders. And there have been quite a few members of our staff that have volunteered through CLSI in uh, document development, as well as other scientific endeavors. So it certainly gives individuals professional growth opportunities, as well as contributing to the scientific community at large. I thought it would be important to actually share from the grassroots what our leaders are saying uh, who have volunteered um, at the CLSI. 
and our doctoral leader for molecular diagnostics has shared that they really find it very valuable to influence guideline development and also that helps to promote patient safety and quality throughout not only our laboratory, but laboratories that participate in, in these documents. There's also great opportunity to meet other scientific leaders, as well as to contribute to the scientific community at large. There's also a degree of learning that occurs to these various activities as you research all the background for guideline development. Our phlebotomy school program director really spoke to how this is impacting her role as an educator and the impact on the workforce. I really love her quote here and I'll just read it because it really resonates on how important her role in guideline development was in educating students as this is the standard for quality for patients. She said, I feel more now than ever that playing a part in the writing of these documents not only helps laboratories write policies according to the standards, but reinforces that they are followed so that the standard of care is given to each and every patient, no matter which phlebotomist performs their draw. So she's really carrying forward to the student level about how important following standards is in their practice. I'm going to transition next to talk about a few CLSI related initiatives, initiatives within our laboratory and how we utilize CLSI guidance on those initiatives. Although there are many examples where our scientific leaders do, do um, uh, consult the CLSI documents, we thought that these three should be highlighted. They are business continuity planning, our journey toward implementing a laboratory quality management system and blood tube vendor change validation. So I'll cover the business continuity planning and Barbara will cover the other two initiatives. Back in 2017, our organization, like other organizations, is very interested in ensuring there was business continuity in the event of a disaster to their operations. So we organized a multidisciplinary laboratory committee in 2017, and our first order of business was to research whatever available guidance there was on developing a standard approach to, to disaster planning. And so a few of us set out and we did a lot of research on this and we came across the GP36 guideline that we have utilized extensively as a resource in the development of our planning. And a few things have resulted from that. We developed a disaster plan guide and that includes several things and it basically is this giant master spreadsheet with multiple tabs that includes checklists, communication tables, who's a primary, secondary, and even a tertiary backup for things such as media inquiries, HR issues, vendor supply issues, et cetera. So we really took a comprehensive approach on communications and who would be the consistent, reliable resource as the primary and secondary backups. It also has things such as um, a test menu that would be restricted in times of urgency, depending on absentee rates or staff availability or competency levels. We also took a stab at developing a, a comprehensive uh, competency grid that shows all of our staff members what they are competent in. So if the time came where they had to perform alternate roles, that would be a document that would be a resource that we could use on who is competent to do alternate roles during a disaster. We also created a matrix showing test menus with geographical backups within a system and within our region. So if one site couldn't perform a particular test or couldn't per perform testing at all, what would be our backup and contingency plans? So this is fully documented. 
And then in the end, once we had all these pieces together, we really had to test the process. So we worked very closely with our emergency management services within our health system to do tabletop scenarios. And we worked through a couple of scenarios and we really got a really nice after action report that only um, that not only described what our strengths were through this process, but also opportunities for improvement. And we will continue to do these kinds of testing of the process so that we could be in a state of readiness. I'd like to turn over the next slides to Barbara Booth at this time. Thank you, Diana. The first thing I'd like to discuss is something Diana touched on earlier, and that's education of the laboratory quality management system. We uh, wanted to take a look at that deeper at our organization, and we soon realized that while some, some in our organization had um, knowledge of what a QMS is, others thought quality was just looking at indicators. So we realized soon after that we needed to educate our team that was looking at this concept. And uh, we looked around for resources and we found a very good resource at CLSI. CLSI has a 13 credit course and um, we had over 20 people take that course through CLSI. And the great part about that was that the health the health system discount allowed us to have so many people take that course. So that was really the start of our deeper dive into looking at our current quality management system. So soon after we started gap analysis and we're just going through each QSC. And the first one we started on was obviously writing um, a quality document or improving the quality document that we had. And you can see which CLSI requirement we use or um, concept or document that we used for, for that journey. The second thing, the first QSC that we really looked at was documents and records. Coincidentally, we were implementing a new um, document control system where we had just implemented it. So it was very timely. And the documents that we used to do that gap analysis are listed there. And I just want to share with you some of the things that even after this new um, implementation, what we found that we needed to improve. So one of the things that we found, um, we needed somebody to say, we needed to document someone as the overseer of that document and records management system for our laboratory. So we did that and uh, we realized that we also had very specific laboratory guidelines we needed. We had certain templates. We wanted, uh, obviously, things to be done in a certain way. So not only did we have documents for that, but we realized we had to find, we had to provide education for our laboratory staff and provide ongoing education. So we're actually, though this QSC was looked at a while ago, um, we're still fi finalizing, fine-tuning that for our group. Um, now we're doing recordings of um, educations that we could support to new users and um, existing users. Another item that we pulled out of our gap analysis was our backup and downtime system. While we had one, it was um, we had room for improvement. And I'm happy to say that we were able to refine that backup process and um, CLSI helped us point us in that direction. Not only do we do we have a better backup process? It is an automated backup process. So it happens every week without human intervention, which is really a delight. Another item that we uh, chose to do a gap analysis on or the next item was organization and leadership. And of course we found many, um, not many, but uh, several gaps in documents that we needed. But I have to say one of the most um, one of the most beneficial and meaningful items that we developed through that process was the quality quality effectiveness document that we developed. In this way, every one of our sites, each one of our hospital sites and our clinics are involved in submitting a quality effective, effectiveness document. We're currently doing it monthly, but we're evaluating whether that is too frequent. Um, but we develop it as template through that organization and leadership gap analysis using some of the tools supplied to us through CLSI. Next slide. The other project that we took on, and this was several years ago, is we had a change in vendor of our blood tube collections. And uh, that was a vast, very big project. As you could see, it, it looked at, it involved many specialty areas of our laboratory, blood bank, flow cytometry, chemistry, microbiology, molecular, 
all kinds of uh, special chemistry diagnostics. So we had to use the full encyclopedia of um, documents available to us through CLSI to look at stability, dilutions, and centrifuges, result comparability, and um, accuracy and precision, which is done with all validations. So that covered a great deal of documents, a great deal of professional laboratory professionals to accomplish this task. And we were grateful to have this, this body of knowledge through CLSI to um, complete that project. And thank you, I'll turn it over to Jessica. Thank you both so much. I am now going to hand this over to Gina. Great, thank you. And um, and thank you for having us today uh, as well. And so I'll just do a bit of an introduction of Health Partners Laboratories um, and talk about how we've incorporated uh, CLSI uh, documents into our efforts to standardize. And so uh, Health Partners Laboratories, as we said in the beginning, is uh, based in Minnesota, covers Western Wisconsin as well. And we have uh, annually combined perform around 10 million tests, and we have over 900 laboratory employees. Uh, 60 plus locations, we have eight hospital-based laboratories, as well as many clinics um, and a standalone high throughput laboratory, which is our primary reference laboratory um, performing uh, chemistries and uh, things like that for our entire system. We, uh, like Geisinger, have a centralized leadership. And so our laboratories report into a centralized leadership structure. And we've had our CLSI system membership since 2017. We have many ongoing research partnerships, including a large scale project with Helix Genomics. And so um, that's something that we're really excited about and we've been working on for the past year. A bit about our family of care locations. So we cover about a 170 mile um, distance across from kind of central Minnesota over to Western Wisconsin. So over in what we call the Prairie is uh, Livia Hospital and Hutchinson Hospital, some rural hospitals, all the way over to Amory, Wisconsin. Our primary area of service, however, is in the Twin City metro area. Um, so we have uh, two large hospitals within the Twin Cities, a, a trauma hospital um, and then a community hospital and then many clinics that support within the metro and suburban areas. So a lot of um, geographic urban rural range that we cover with our services. A lot of our work is driven through our broader organization. So we're an integrated medical system. We're integrated with a healthcare plan as well. And our five-year strategic roadmap takes us into 2025. And one of the things that have been really important um, to us as a system is operating as a system. Oh, my little graphic. My, my animation went away, but that is okay. Um, so one of our strategies uh, as I said, is operate as a system. And that is going to lead us to our goals of healthy, high-performing teams, best outcomes, grow and diversify, and competitive costs. So I think sound like Geising's journey as well is we also did a gap analysis. Um, and when I first started in my role as the quality director about two years ago almost, uh, one of the things we really needed to get a handle on was what is our current state related to quality? Uh, previously, we had been functioning as kind of separate houses within the system. And so while we were um, patient-centered, patient we were dealing with things very locally. So even though patients were moving across our sites, we were making local decisions. Um, we all had very robust quality management systems and quality control processes. Uh, we focus on employee safety, and then we were bringing in many students across the system. But again, very much functioning as independent silos within our system. So taking a look at that, you know, really deciding who can we become. We can become patient-centered and view our patients holistically and through patient populations. So we wanted to make sure that we could take events that are uh, occur at one site and incorporate them into safer practices across all of our locations. 
um, while we had safe practices, we wanted to standardize our approach to safety. There's no reason that we should have different types of safety policies or training or education. Uh, talking about high reliability, so wanting to make sure that we embed high reliability principles into our processes with an upstream focus so making sure that we prevent errors before they occur. And that was only going to be possible if we could gather data from across our system and learn from positive outliers. And then as a learning organization, really sharing our resources to create a cohesive and valuable student education program and create standard competency materials for our platforms and processes. And so taking us really from these siloed houses of an organization and putting us all together with the puzzle pieces, um, we needed to look and see, uh, again, where's our current state and how can we move forward with our journey to standardization. So assessing our areas of alignment, and I'm just pulling a bit out of here to focus on today's um, session, but we realized that um, not all of our labs are using a formal QMS program, but if they were, they were primarily using the CLSI quality system essentials as their base. So that was positive, knowing that we were primarily aligned in that area, but that we still had some work to do. Um, with our quality assessment, you know, we were taking a look at uh, everybody's individual quality indicators, and now we're on our journey to standardize those indicators and how we present them. And then knowing going into this role that we had a system membership, trying to assess how our utilization uh, is going. And so while all sites were members, our utilization was variable across the system. And so we've been looking at ways that we can incorporate the CLSI information and uh, documents into our best practices and our quality program. So our technical team structure is really what drives our work um, and these are really organizing our teams by uh, technical area, bench, if you will. And so we have uh, 16 technical teams and they work with their team leaders. They work with our laboratory information system and they work with our operations leaders to drive all of the work we do, all of the standardization, all of the policy work that we do um, for the entire system. And so these technical teams contain uh, members from across, all different representatives, um, and then they finally report into a laboratory steering committee, which is comprised of our laboratory executive leadership, as well as our uh, medical directors and pathologists. So huge area of standardization, it's ongoing, right? I think for any system, but it's around policy standardization. And I think this is where CLSI really shines and is able to uh, help support our needs with the uh, documents and the templates and the information they have. And so as we've worked to standardize our policies, uh, we've created common definitions using the CLSI documents, um, created common headers for our policies using the step action table formatting, and then incorporating best practices into the policy and procedure design. So as our technical teams are working through their various policies and working on combining them, we've actually written into our document control policy that these teams will use the most up-to-date reference materials available, including regulatory standards, scientific literature, industry guidelines, product inserts, and consensus standards. And so we've written that in to remind these teams that every time they're looking at a policy or procedure, they should also be referencing back at the current literature and seal aside documents to make sure that we're following best practices. Another area that we've been working on is how do we make decisions as a system? So as we're still very well on our journey of becoming, you know, from those siloed houses into a condominium. And so we need to have ways that we can come to consensus as a team. And so one of those things that we've done is create a risk assessment tool that can help us take a look at various processes, assess risk associated with them or risk associated with changing process, and then make a final decision. And so, you know, taking a look at the CLSI risk management techniques has been helpful in helping us develop our form. Um, and so what we do is we take a look at our current state, again, with various processes, understanding uh, the history behind those, any previous regulatory or safety events or um, 
or findings related to that? What's our community standard? And again, what are our best practice guidelines? So what is, uh, does CLSI have anything to say about this particular subject? And then we score those based on impact to safety, operations, the resources needed to make a change, any regulatory concerns, and then again, incorporating best practice recommendations and recommendations from our other stakeholders uh, to make a final decision. And so here I have an example of what that uh, template looks like. And so, you know, going through the workflows, identifying any concerns, any data related to that. And then again, we have an opportunity to um, summarize best practice standards and our regulatory standards, because that really needs to weigh in uh, when we're, you know, choosing between some very historically embedded practices, third party uh, guidelines can be very valuable for us. And they have been. <laughs> we've got many examples where we've pulled in um, and we've been able to make decisions using this tool. And then here I want to talk about our accreditation standardization efforts. So this has been a huge, huge haul. Um, and frankly, we, you know, are going from four different accrediting organizations, um, one that's been surveying half of our hospitals and clinics, um, another that's surveying about the other half of our hospitals, and then one that's surveying half of our clinics right now. And then we've also got the State Department of Health that's been surveying some of our, one of our hospitals and their clinics. And so moving from all of that into a single accreditor has been about a year and a half long process so far for us. And so um, we started back in July, or not July, January actually of last year and brought together a group to help make the decision on how we would even make this decision. So, you know, you have to come up with the criteria um, for how you move to a single accreditor. And so again, that's where I think um, CLSI has been helpful for us. As we started that pre-work, we created the evaluation team and we developed that criteria. And I'll talk about the resources we were able to use there. Um, and then finally, we sent a request out to all of the various accrediting uh, organizations for their feedback. So really wanting to hear from them what they would be able to offer us um, as an organization to help us become really the best we could be. Uh, we took the time to evaluate and score all those responses. So really thinking of it as an RFP that you might do for instrumentation. That's how we treated the um, accreditation process communicating those findings and making a final decision. And that's really where we're kind of in between the communication and the implementation piece right now, uh, where we've just started to kick off and take a look at how we're going to implement um, becoming a system that uses one single accrediting organization. So as I said, coming up with the criteria and kind of following a structure, we were able to reference the CLSI QMS 17 document uh, external assessments, audits, and inspections of the laboratory to give us a framework. And so this was another one of those things where we start along the path and it, we go back to say, wait a second, does CLSI have anything to say about the external assessments process? And sure enough, they do. You know, there was a document that we were able to reference and go back to um, and just do the gut check, make sure that we really are following um, all the best practices that we're considering everything in our criteria that we could consider. Um, and we used this process to create our roadmap going forward. So identifying the scope of assessment, so understanding which laboratories would and would not be included in our, um, our proposal content for a new external organization. Um, talking about the uh, organizational structure. So here CLSI recommends that the external assessment plan include a listing of all the resources that will be needed, the personnel involved and their respective re roles and responsibilities in the process. And these are things that maybe, you know, you could come up with on your own, but knowing you have a document to help drive that work just makes it 10 times easier. So um, that's been a huge piece for us here is understanding our roles and responsibilities related to this change. Timing and schedule. So having a schedule of the key events and milestones, including uh, the expected timing dependencies and personnel, that's been incredibly important. 
uh, going through the budget right now. And then contracts and conditions assessment, again, we're really going through that process right now. And so we've been able to use this framework to help move our organization, again, from four different accrediting organizations to a single accrediting organization. So I've shared the very concrete examples of how Health Partners has been able to use the CLSI documents um, to help us on our journey for standardization, but we still know that we have additional areas to expand. So one of the things that we've uh, recently created is a, a system intranet page. So within Health Partners, we have intranet pages and uh, we're uh, working on listing CLSI webinars on that internet page and so that staff can easily access those, know that they're available to them where they can sign up. Um, I think another big thing is expanding the volunteer opportunities. So we have, you know, as a delegate, I've been sharing volunteer opportunities as I see them come up, but I think we have a greater opportunity to share those um, with our different technical areas. And then including the information about this in our new employee onboarding. So we recently uh, hired a position to help us organize our training and education program from a system perspective. And um, I think including this information in new employee onboarding and then future uh, information for those employees will be helpful. It just shows them right off the bat that these are the resources that you have as part of uh, being a health partners employee. And here's what's included in that. And so, um, you know, I, I've already learned a lot, I think, from the other presenters today, and I'll be taking things back with me on how we can improve, you know, our uh, access to our employees. And um, thank you all for your time today with me. So thank you, Jenna. And over back to Jessica. Thank you. Um, so let's proceed with an overview of this membership option. The system membership extends all level one benefits to all staff at different sites under one membership umbrella. The benefits include access to Eclipse, our full online library of documents. With this membership, you gain significant savings in membership dues per site instead of paying for each location as a separate membership. You can also provide simplified administration with one membership account to manage and one single license to Eclipse that covers all users system-wide. The benefits include full online access to Eclipse for all staff at the covered locations, a 70% discount off educational programs such as the LQMS certificate program and print items. As an organizational member, all employees are eligible to make purchases at the same discounted rate. They just need to make sure that their CLSI login is connected to the membership. Standards development opportunities, propose new projects, vote, and volunteer for committee roles to develop new standards, access free webinars, accreditation resources, and more in your MyCLSI account to keep your lab thriving and learning. While a delegate and alternate oversee the system membership, each site can have an appointed administrator to manage users and relay CLSI information down the line. This simplified administration helps promote full user access. So the base price for this membership is 8,500 for up to eight sites and the cost per site decreases with more sites added. Um, we're always happy to work with you on a custom quote based on your system. So currently we have 111 health system members that cover almost 2000 sites from 11 countries. Um, these include hospital systems, multi-site government entities and more. Making the most of membership, sharing staff benefits. As the delegate, it is important to share the benefits with staff to make the most of your membership. You can manage users in MyCLSI. You can appoint a site administrator at each location to manage users accordingly as well. When a new user is added in MyCLSI, they will receive an automatic email prompting them to log in and access their new member benefits. Nominate a colleague for a volunteer opportunity when there are open calls for volunteers. Access free webinars included with this membership level and sign up for e-learning courses with the 70% member discount. Um, as I mentioned, these benefits extend to all staff at the covered sites. They just need to have their own CLSI login under the membership to utilize these benefits. Make sure your volunteer profile is up to date 
Everyone sets up their own profile, email preferences, and areas of interest to receive communications on opportunities and updates related to their own area of expertise. Expanding CLSI involvement, delegate responsibilities. The delegate's biggest responsibility is communication, both with CLSI and within your organization regarding CLSI's activities. Administer and promote membership benefits within your organization. Recruit volunteers to participate in CLSI's consensus process. Propose standards for development. Nominate candidates for the board of directors and other leadership positions. It is important to circulate draft documents for internal review, then collate the comments and cast a vote on CLSI documents on behalf of your organization. Provide training and an overview of new or revised CLSI documents as they come out. You can appoint an alternate to assist with these delegate responsibilities. You may update any member information, the delegate information, or add an alternate to your membership at any time by completing the form in your MyCLSI account. CLSI's new member logo. We are very excited about our new member logo um, and it is available on our website. We encourage members to use the logo to highlight their commitment to laboratory excellence and promote their affiliation to CLSI. The terms and conditions can be found on our website and we have different versions available for download um, in our different CLSI colors. Position your organization for success. We have a free on-demand webinar, Making the Most of Your Membership. You can access this past webinar to learn more helpful information on your CLSI membership, see a demo of Eclipse and of my CLSI, and learn more about your role as a delegate. Um, our new CEO, Barb, also joined us um, during this webinar. Another free on-demand webinar that we have is Expanding CLSI Involvement. You can access this webinar to learn more about how to expand CLSI volunteer involvement at your organization. Abbott's delegate joined us to discuss how her organization created a CLSI intelligence team. You can learn more about our volunteer process, the new delegate commenting feature, and how to see who from your organization has applied to a position already. The CLSI Delegate Handbook. You can access these guidelines for delegates and alternates in your MyCLSI account at any time. The handbook contains more detail on CLSI membership, how to access your benefits, the distribution of CLSI information, the CLSI consensus process, CLSI and ISO, and how-to guides for adding or managing users and personalizing your CLSI account. New and upcoming documents and products. Um, so here is a list of our most recently published from the last few months. Um, if you have Eclipse already as a level one member, then you can access these documents in there. And as the delegate, you will get an email notifying you when these new publications are released. The Breakpoint Implementation Toolkit. Streamline your Breakpoint implementation process to meet new CAP requirements effective January 2024 with the BIT Toolkit. To make Breakpoint updates easier, CLSI has developed in partnership with APHL, ASM, CAP, and the CDC, a free, comprehensive, and user-friendly toolkit. You can download this directly on our website. Here is a list of what is coming up in the next few months, um, with a few of these documents actually due out in the next week or two. Um, if you are the delegate or alternate, you are already signed up to get emails, so you will be notified when these do publish. Um, and to see a current list of what is expected to come out at any point, you can visit Projects in Progress under the Standards Main Menu tab on our website. Follow us on social media to stay current, um, and please note these key email addresses for reference. Thank you to our speakers for sharing their health system journey and for all of you who attended this webinar. We appreciate you making time in your busy schedules to join us today. Please feel free to reach out to us at any point during your membership. 
we will now open this up to questions. Thank you, Jessica. At this time, we will open it up for audience questions. As a reminder, to submit your questions, please use the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your Zoom. I'll go ahead and ask you our first question. Uh, what was or is most beneficial in helping make staff aware of and start using member ben benefits? I could take a stab at that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so within our laboratory, you know, we rely a lot on electronic means of communication. And we do recognize that staff don't always have the opportunity to be looking at their email a lot like administrators of the laboratory have a tendency to see their email a little bit more. So we make sure that if there's anything that's pertinent, uh, we bring it up during our system huddle. Um, whether it's an opportunity or something that's related to a new cap requirement, that there's a resource that's available. I know Barbara does it and her team do an excellent job at making sure we are aware of CAP requirements and certainly the related uh, supporting things uh, to address new CAP requirements. In addition, our laboratory has a um, structure, a quality structure called best practice teams. And it's where various disciplines of the laboratory get together and there's representation from throughout the system. And part of the standard agenda is making sure that they're aware of new and upcoming regulations, as well as they may reference then CLSI documents or other materials or educational resources. So uh, those two things happen within our laboratory, the system huddle, as well as the best practice teams. However, you know, there's always room for improvement. Uh, we're not perfect. And certainly I'm, I'm learning some things too from fellow presenters here today, as well as some from some of the material that Jessica has provided. Thank you. Any other comments before we move to the next question? Yeah, I would, I would um, second that, I think. You know, like I said, for us, um, creating that staff intranet page and having that be kind of our one-stop shop uh, for webinars and information has been valuable in communicating it with staff. Uh, we also recently created a system newsletter that goes out to all of our staff where we've been communicating upcoming education opportunities. Um, and then really, I think, uh, you know, as I've pointed out, I think one of the most valuable ways is to embed it as much as possible into our standard work and our expected practices. So if we're asking, you know, consistently for staff to go take a look at the standards first, can you, you know, go take a look at the CLSI standards, then it becomes practice for them. And that's where they're going to want to go when they have a question um, about best practice. So Wonderful. All right. Well, let's move on to our next question. What do you find to be the most valuable benefit for your organization since becoming a health system member? So we, um, I actually don't remember the time before we were health system members. That was actually before my time in this role. Um, so we have been since my tenure. Um, however, I think that the, just the ease of access and knowing that everybody can get on. So if I, if I am referencing documents or we are talking, you know, oh, that was in the CLSI, this document everybody can go in and access that and knowing that we don't have to deal with the issues of you know oh my site didn't choose to pay for that or you know we don't um we don't know how to get in there i think that's been the most valuable is we can all speak the same language and we all have the same resource um as we've worked to standardize policies as i i talked about you know our areas of alignment referencing the qms and the qsc documents I've been, they, you know, I had questions about, oh, well, wh where did you see that? You know, where, where's your primary reference source? And I was able to show them the document and they can get in on their own time and take a look at, uh, you know, what we're talking about when we're talking about the QSCs. So I think it's just that open access that's been the most valuable that I've mm -hmm. seen. Yeah. And Diana, I would, Barbara. yeah, I would second what Gina is saying as far as the easy access to documents. And you know, we've been legacy members, I think, since 1979, and their health system uh, membership was in 2020. So you know, I feel very confident that all of our scientific leaders just go to CLSI as their first resource for you know when they're looking at uh, protocols and, and other things. Um, 
you know, and I don't also say that recently, I think that CLSI for at least for us is becoming like a go-to for education. So as we think of things as a system and we're getting like multidisciplinary groups together across the system and we need to educate ourselves about something. And the example we used today was the LQMS implementation. You know, we all wanted to become certified and become more knowledgeable because we needed to. And so we saw CLSI as the resource for um, an education around this. Um, and so I think that's become a little bit more prominent that we think of like CLSI as our go-to for some education. Thank you. We've got a two-part question here. Do you or how do you track participation inside your organization? And has participation in CLSI increased in your organization since adopting a health system membership? I could confidently say that the participation has increased because I look at um, the list of individuals who have uh, a login access to the site. It's certainly much larger than it was years ago. And we have a process through our administrative support personnel that when we have a new scientific leader or an operational leader that joins our health system, you know, they get signed up. So um, I'm pretty confident that um, access as well as uh, use of the the resources has increased. Yeah, and we haven't been tracking that um, by the numbers, but as I shared when I started, I did that gap analysis so we could see kind of where the current state is for everybody. Um, and I know this most recent time when we renewed, uh, we had more interested parties on, you know, wanting to make sure that they were set up the same way as everybody else. And so, you know, I think for us, it's going to be a matter of going back and taking a look at our, our gap analysis and identifying, you know, does everybody feel like now are they having consistent use of their site? Um, but we have not been tracking by the numbers. So I think that's a really good question um, and something to bring back to our program. Thanks. Your next question is multi-part, so I'll go ahead and read it slowly here. How does your organization help support or encourage volunteering who or what types of roles in your organization participate on committees, and how do you encourage more widespread involvement? Yeah, I would be really interested to see what Geisinger um, has, because I think they have, um, you know, it sounds like maybe more robust uh, volunteering, but we have uh, several scientific directors as well, and so we've definitely been sharing the volunteer opportunities with them, but I think this is an area of opportunity for us. You know, as I pointed out in our uh, presentation, I would love to learn more about how to promote volunteer opportunities within our, our system. So we've had several members of our team that are not only involved with uh, consensus document development, but also have volunteered in other ways with, you know, preparing guidelines. Um, I think there's room for improvement as well. We do share uh, the information when it comes across from CLSI, whether they're looking for, you know, volunteers for particular uh, guidelines that are going to be developed or even for board members. We have shared that. We've had an individual actually, you know, put their name in the ring. So it was good to see that people are starting to think about how can I contribute professionally um, as a board, uh, potential board member. So um, I think we could be doing a better job at Geisinger, but historically we've, we've had individuals who are interested and have already participated, but I think there's room for improvement there. Thank you. We've got another question here. How do you assess standardization or other operational efficiencies resulting from your membership with CLSI? I guess I could, this is Barb, I could add a little bit about that. Um, standardization is and always will be uh, a goal of ours. And I think um, using the tools at CLSI gives credence to um, the information that we bring to the table at every one of our projects. Yeah, and I, I think for us, it's really, uh, it comes down to being the the way to move forward sometimes. And so, you know, as I shared that, that risk assessment tool that we're using, you know, the weight of CLSI in moving those projects forward can be heavy. And so that's, you know, one way that we're able to assess that 
um, effectiveness is really just being able to make those decisions that until recently we've been stuck frankly, um, and having, like I said, historically embedded processes. So that's one way that we can. And then we are measuring our um, policy standardization work. And so we're looking at our percent standard policies uh, year over year, so. And, and what do you wish you knew sooner? Hmm. <laughs> I think that, oh, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry, Jane. I, I think the discount for the membership on educational was really a uh, eye opener for us. And we really took advantage of it on that one um, journey we took for QMS. Yeah, I think there's certainly um, still times that we are running up against situations and CLSI wasn't our first stop. And then we go back and say, wait, what do they have to say about it? And then we find out, oh, <laughs> they've got a whole you know, document pertaining to exactly what we've been discussing. And so it's embedding and, and, um, and hardwiring that practice of, of really checking there first. And that's just something that we're all uh, just constantly you know, getting used to as we uh, move forward on our standardization projects. Thank you. In full, trans, in full transparency, as I was preparing for this uh, presentation, you know, I took a deeper dive into the member area. <clears throat> and there is a really nice Eclipse dashboard that kind of lays out, you know, all the new documents that came out or the ones that maybe were modified. And so I think that's something that was learned, that it's an easy access point to get like information at your fingertips. Thank you so much. It looks like there's one more question in the queue, and this one is actually for Jessica. Um, our current membership was just renewed, and we are interested in the system option. Is it possible to upgrade mid-membership year? And what if we have mul multiple locations with active memberships already? Yes, so we can send you a prorated quote to upgrade um, for the remaining months of membership in your current year. And we will um, review any sites you think might have current memberships um, and then factor those into the cost as well. So they, they merge under into the new um, membership year cycle. Thank you so much. And that was our last question. With that, we must conclude today's webinar. If you have any remaining questions, please send them to membership at clsi.org. A link to a recorded version of this webinar will be sent to you by email within the next two weeks. Thank you for your participation in today's webinar. We hope to see you here again soon. Today's program is copyright 2023 by the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute with all rights reserved. This does conclude the program. Thank you, and you may now disconnect. Thank you.